You with Optus? No, thank God, because otherwise I would be one of the 10 million Australians, that's 167 Optus stadiums, who suffered the catastrophic inconvenience of not having mobile coverage for a few hours. I need my primary phone. Shut up, shut up, everybody! Because they were cheap. Australia's biggest ever telecommunications outage was detected around 4am on Wednesday morning, when early risers realised they couldn't connect to Pornhub and had to use their imaginations. It starts with yes. Actually, it starts with why the f*** is my phone saying SOS only? Disappointed! Optus chief executive Kelly Bayer-Rosmarin didn't fill customers with confidence when four hours later she admitted she still didn't know what had happened and was quote unquote still working on it. Oh, it's red wire to red wire. <laughs> what idiot dreamed that up? Optus's mainly elderly landline customers were told they would not be able to get through to triple zero and to use their mobile phones if they had one if they needed police fireys or an ambo. Hello? Hello? Stupid cordless phone? You can usually get through to triple zero even if your carrier is down because of a telco protocol known as camping. Allows you to connect to another network in an emergency. 911, what's your emergency? An emergency like 10 million people not being able to watch TikTok. Mostly I use it to watch pornography and TikToks. The same 10 million people, incidentally, who had their data hacked last year. Going to be a lot of angry customers. The good news for Optus on that front is there are very few people to log those complaints because the company sacked a lot of its call centre staff. WA Premier Roger Cook fronted the media to address the issue, possibly happy there was finally an organisation recording lower approval ratings than his government. <laughs> Thank God for that. Roger said we were probably through the worst of it. I don't know if he meant the comms outage or his premiership. Got him. Optus still doesn't know what went wrong, but was getting services back on track by the afternoon. Just in the nick of time. Means people can watch the latest episode of Vanishing Cousins Evil by the Beach. Getting to the pointy end now, this is the fourth of five instalments and it's a cracker of an episode. I was surprised that Raylene would have been hanging out at a place like that, to be honest. For those not in the know, the series examines the disappearance of teenage cousins Raylene Eaton and Yvonne Waters, who were last seen on April 7, 1974, at a Sunday session at the White Sands Hotel in Scarborough. Vanished. One of the most bizarre unsolved crimes in this country's history. All sorts of theories about what happened to them. Some people believe they'd run away to the eastern states. A girl who had gone to school with us contacted the police and told them that she had seen Raylene in a shop. The cops thought maybe they were snatched by a serial killer. Well, the first person we investigated was Christopher Worrell, who's infamous for the, the Truro murders in South Australia. And there's a suspect alive, a guy cops thought was keen on one of the girls, who is living in WA as we speak. I only know about my appearance, not someone else's disappearance. Episode 4 introduces a pretty sinister line of inquiry. A bike killing? We pulled up and there were motorbikes all on the front lawn. 1974 was very early days for WA's outlaw clubs. The Coffin Cheaters and Gypsy Jokers were only two or three years old by that time. The Cheaters did have a presence in Scarborough, which is where the girls were last seen, and also in Bayswater, which is where Raylene lived with her family. It's a loose connection, though. An informant who spoke on condition of anonymity remembers a particular night at number 13 Hastings Street in Scarborough, where the girls had been known to go because Raylene's brother lived there. One of the girls we were with started mucking about, teasing the bike and chatting them up. So we moved fast, got her out. Bloody lucky escape. It's a hard case to crack. The complete opposite of this next one. A very excitable bloke named Evan James Martin is about to be sentenced for murdering child snatcher Ashley Brofo, who grabbed a kid from a park in Doubleview a while back and happens to be stepbrother to Cleo Smith kidnapper Terence Kelly. Evan clearly does not like pedophiles. He used a homemade knife to stab one of them whilst inside jail, and as recently as February had bragged to other inmates that he was going to kill a sex offender to do the public a service. Despite his history and that pretty explicit warning, the Department of Corrective Services decided they would house him in a unit at Hakia Prison that was home to child molesters. Why did they do that? Because they're f***ing idiots. One of Evan's mates inside found out that Ashley Brofo was going to be his new cellmate. He realised it would likely kick off and warn the guards. What do they do? Apparently not very much, because on March 8, Evan cornered Brofo in a cell and belted him before strangling him to death 24 hours later. This guy walks out of the cell and tells anyone who'd listen what he'd done. 
He then admits the crime to police and goes to the trouble of writing a detailed letter about how he squeezed to stop the pedophile blood going to his brain. He really didn't make it hard for the he cops. He then wrote letters to other friends bragging about it, tells detectives, and I quote, he deliberately, unremorsefully murdered him, contacts the director of public prosecutions to let him know he was f***ing so proud of taking Brofo's life, and during his first appearance in court tells the judge he's pleading not just guilty, but very guilty. It starts with yes. I'm Ben Harvey. Two young girls, they mattered to people. There's unexpected turns and unexpected results. 